Okay, so uh, as we start into Genesis, uh, a couple of different things. One, uh, on the handout at the bottom gives you the reading for next week. I'll try and put that there every time. Uh, and then the, the handout's a little bit different this time in that in this section of Genesis, uh, chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 3, there's so much in there that... Uh, you can almost think of the handout as being more supplementary to what we're covering in class. Uh, it's, a, it's a chance for you to go and look and compare things you see in Genesis to other texts. And um, what I recommend you do is just sometime over the course of the week, just sit down with your Bible, looking at Genesis and then looking at the corresponding verses there and ask yourself the question, what are the connections I can find between Christ and the creation story? Uh, there's so much in there that we can't cover it all in the 45 minutes we have here. So this is some uh, extra additional opportunity to um, focus your mind on how Christ has been involved every step of the way. Um, in Genesis 1, we have the creation event. And in six days, God creates everything. As we go through that, keeping in mind that this class is not really just a class on Genesis, but a class on Jesus in Genesis, um, you see multiple times where Jesus is going to show up. Uh, one of the most significant being, let us make man in our image. And that phrase, us, references the idea of multiple individuals having a conversation. And so... Uh, Start class with that uh, discussion question is pretty typical for me. Um, how would you explain to someone, if you were talking to somebody, how would you explain to someone what it means to be made in the image of God and how that is significant? Why is that a big deal? Uh, so what is it and why does it matter? Okay. So it's not physically in his image. That's not the, the bit that we're talking about. So that, that's a good point. We should eliminate what it's not up front. Okay. Anything else? Oh, I'm going to go with Mary and then Jeremy. He's eternal, we're eternal, okay? Um, we would clarify that, that he's eternal in both directions, right? We're eternal in one, but yes, absolutely. From the point of our creation, we become eternal, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have this conversation made amongst three individuals about making somebody else who can do the things that they can do, and one of those things that they are doing at that moment is, is having a relationship and a conversation about what are our goals, what do we want. Uh, so absolutely. Anything else? Yes. So another aspect, once again, back to that conversation that they have, let us make man. There's a making. They're makers, right? The Godhead are makers, and they make us to be makers, to have dominion, to uh, have authority, just as they have authority. As you mentioned, it's a, there's a restraint to that. We don't have the level of authority that God does, but there is certainly a realm for which humanity has a great deal of authority. 
Uh, anything else anybody would add to that? Mm -hmm. So, and that's back to what Perry was talking about, right? That you, you, it's not the physical. So if it's not the physical that we're made in the image, if it is the spiritual, was that what you were going to say there? Yeah. So uh, a verse, and we'll talk about it a little bit more as we progress, is John chapter 4, verse 24, where it simply says, God is spirit. So if he is spirit, and we're made in his image, we too are spirits, right? We're spiritual beings. We have physical bodies, but that body decays and, and the spiritual goes on. So, yeah. Uh, anything else? So you begin to look at some of those things, and those are very profound ideas. They are, they are essential to humanity and to what we're doing here. Um, if you remove those things, you remove that capacity for relationship, you remove our ability to, to choose um, and to make and have dominion, right? Because built into the idea of having dominion and authority is the idea that you can choose what you're going to do with that authority. If you remove those things, you really remove everything that makes us human. And you imagine you take humanity and you remove our ability to have relationships, you remove our creative desire, you remove the spiritual element of us so that we're just like the animals who have a life that goes back to the earth. Um, you, have, you have gutted us of everything that makes us human, right? So everything that you care about that is you is made because you're made in the image of God. Um, so as we look at Genesis chapter 1, it begins with the phrase, in the beginning, God. And in the light of looking at this text uh, in light of Jesus, something we should be aware of is that word for God there, the Hebrew word Elohim, is plural. So when it says in the beginning God, it's talking about a plurality of God that created the heavens and earth. So now we'll see further down that plurality when they say, let us make man in our image. But for us in English, the first time we notice that, hey, there's multiples, they're having a conversation here is when you get down to let us make man in our image. But if you were reading in Hebrew you would have noticed it in the very first sentence. In the beginning, gods created the heaven and the earth. Now, um, there's several things that we'll want to look at here. But one of the things is, as we look at Jesus, in the beginning, gods, and so we'll go and look at places like John chapter 1, um, and how Jesus is involved in that creation process. Something else we want to consider is that there are parallels from the beginning of the Bible to the end. And one of the things that you see in the Bible is the Bible begins with God creating the heavens and the earth. And then you get to Revelation chapter 21. You get right down to the end of the Bible. And God is creating a new heavens and a new earth. And he says, behold, I make all things new. The Bible begins with Adam and Eve in paradise, and it ends with mankind back in paradise. The, the story of the creation is the story of God making things the way they ought to be, followed by us breaking that. And then the rest of your Bible is God fixing that, so that we can go back to where things are good, very good. And the answer to fixing that is Jesus. So in one very real sense, the reason that it's so valuable to study Jesus in Genesis is, if nowhere else, in chapter 1, you see perfection. You see things exactly as they ought to be. And then after that, everything goes out the window. Right? Adam and Eve throw a brick through the window, and it gets ugly really fast. But there's a small window of time at the beginning of things where it's as it ought to be. And then when you get to the end of the Bible, you look at Jesus, and because of what Jesus does, it gets to be back to what it ought to be again. So you can think of it as 
Jesus is going back to the beginning. Does that make sense? Anybody thoughts on that? Now, there are, there are some distinct differences between the very beginning and the next beginning, the, the new heavens and the new earth. Like, what's a, what's a distinct difference between the creation of Adam and Eve when they're good, very good, and us good, very good in heaven? What's the distinction between the two? In some ways, they're the same, right? Both sin-free, both perfect, both going to be with God. But what's some, some differences? Okay, so one, there's a physical difference, right? They, they're physically on a, on, on a material planet with material bodies. And we are told that, that is, we are going to be given immortal bodies. So it'll be very different in that sense. Yeah. Okay, so one, there, the, the newness, the cleanness of it is by creation. The other one is made by a choice of redemption. And there is a distinction between those two, isn't there? Why do we care about the fact that the second time, right, when we get to heaven eternally, we'll be new, there will be no sin, it'll be like Adam and Eve, but as mentioned, not a physical existence, but we have immortal bodies, we'll be changed, but that it's redem a redemptive story at that point. Like, why do you care about that? Why does that matter to us? Yeah. So, so one aspect to it is you get to be a part of that story, right? If, if we just have the Genesis 1 account, the only ones who get to be a part of it are those who never sin. And Romans makes it clear that's only Jesus. But because of the redemption, we get to participate in that. So their story that Genesis story and beautiful paradise eventually becomes our story because we are chosen through Christ. So that's, that's one very big element to it. Any other things that you can think of that would matter? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we were predestined, then there would be no reason to account for the judgment that would come. Mm -hmm. But if you think about the group of Boaz, you've got David, Jonathan, you've got Joshua, you've got Moses, Abraham, you've got Paul, and all these other people who make choices through that God. So this idea of Rashi and Mahdi Trust is saying that if we accept God's grace, Mm -hmm. So another aspect to it is not just God's choice, but then when you get to heaven, everybody who you see there wanted to be there, right? There was an element of choice on their part, uh, whereas Adam and Eve did not get a choice, right? They doesn't mean they had a bad gig, <laughs> but they didn't get a choice in the matter. Um, but everybody in paradise eternally, you can look around and say they chose to be there. Um, okay, some other things to consider from Genesis. You have something? Yeah. It's a great point, right, that the rest of the Bible from, from the fall forward shows you what God told you. He told you he loved you, and you go, yeah, okay, but then the rest shows how much he means it. Is, is that a fair way to say what you're, yeah. It, yeah, that. Mm-hmm, yeah, so you have, 
an understanding of really all of those pieces um, that you wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah. Um, oh, yes. So going with your parallel, I So in Genesis 1, <laughs> in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Here's a couple other verses to look at. Um, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So this is a, a verse you run into the New Testament uh, that very clearly shows Jesus in Genesis, right? He is there in the creation, and it says that apart from Him, nothing came into being. Now, once again, in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God, God is plural, so then you say, who's the plurality? Well, John 1, 1 through 3, tells you that at least in that plurality is Jesus alongside the Father. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 reemphasizes that idea. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, uh, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. A couple of things that are very interesting about Colossians chapter 1 is when we think about Jesus being the creator in the John 1 where he makes everything, we typically, at least for me, maybe different for you, but for me, I typically think in, in the context of making stuff. He makes trees, he makes flowers, he makes birds, he makes whales, he makes humans, he makes stuff. But here it says, the things that are created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. This isn't just stuff, but dominions that are created. It was mentioned earlier, uh, I think Kyle was the one who mentioned that we have the ability to have authority and dominion, but it's within a certain realm, right? We have a certain boundary to our authority. Um, who set that boundary? Colossians says it was Jesus. Uh, things visible and invisible. What are some invisible things that we know must have been created? Can you think of something you haven't seen, but you know because the Bible tells you exists? Angels would be one, right? Angels are created beings. Our souls. There you go. Yeah, I've never seen my soul. I, I'm, I'm really confident I've got one. Don't know about everybody else sometimes, but I always know of my, I've got one, right? Isn't that funny how that works? Like, if somebody argued with you that you didn't have a soul, you would, they would never win that argument. You know, right? But you've never seen it. It's invisible, it's, but it's a creative thing. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it does. And that, of course, is what Jesus did, right? Jesus saw souls while everybody else saw people shopping in their PJs. Um, it, it makes a difference, right? When you begin to see people as souls, absolutely. Um, so all things have been created through him and for him. Another uh, like area of dominion or rule or authority are relationships, right? Who was it that created marriage? God. Jesus was involved in that process. So all of these things, it's not just the stuff that he made, but it's the way that stuff would interact. And so it's a, it's a really powerful thing. Um, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, In these last days he's spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. So it's very, very clear that Jesus is involved in the creation process. That makes sense? Anybody have any questions on that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, and, and we know that he knew, right? Because if you've been in the Ephesians class, the plan was made before the foundation world. So before anything spoken into existence, you have God knowing this is how it works out. And he, yet he still makes it. He makes it good. He makes it very good. All of those things. And uh, yeah, it's, it's hard for us to fathom because most of us, if we knew we were going to make something that somebody else was immediately going to come in and deface, 
why even make it? Yeah. Just right. Just right. Because yep. anything was off. We can close the too far away. We can rotate too fast. Mm-hmm. Whatever. It's all dead. And it's like, but if you look at that, you see that every code structure in the whole order is perfect and it can work together. Even, you know, people like Richard Dawkins from Dark Side of God says it gives the appearance of being wrong. Yep. Turns out if. It gives the appearance of intelligence. It, it might actually have intelligence behind it. Yeah, crazy how that works. So when you are in Genesis chapter 1 and you look at the creation events, you have six days of creation. Uh, the very beginning of it, God creates material, I guess you might say. Then there is an atmosphere created. Uh, then plants, uh, dry ground. Then um, you have... Uh, the sun and the moon and the stars of the heaven. And, and you might notice that light existed before the sun, the moon, the stars of the heaven. If you look at the creation event, um, I think that, in fact, is an allusion to Jesus, too. Because when you get to the very end of your Bible and we get to that eternal new heaven and new earth, what's the light source then? Anybody remember? Who's the source of light in Revelation? He says, there's no need of light, for God shall be the light. We know you, don't, you did not need a sun and a moon and stars to start to be the initial sources of light. God put them in there for the purpose of seasons, and there's a value to them, and don't mistake me there. But... Initially, light existed before they existed. And there's a statement there, and you see it throughout your Bible, that God is a light. Jesus, when he came into the world, he came in as the light of the world. That the initial source of light for mankind was not the stuff you see up in the sky, but was God himself. Uh, So that's kind of, I, I think, an illusion there. I can't prove that. Remember how I told you there's going to be some things I say, this is definitely Jesus. And then I'll have some say it's probably Jesus and others will be like, maybe. This would be in the maybe category. But I think the terminology of God being light and Jesus being light shows up so often that there's a reason that that order exists in the creation story. That the light exists before the seasonal sources of light, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Um, so, and, and then... Uh, after those, you have the sea animals and the flying creatures, and then you have land uh, animals, and then ultimately mankind as the ultimate of the creation made in the image of God. Um, several other places in the Bible talk about the creation and the, the value of it, and why is it made the way it is. Psalm 19 being one of those. The heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. Psalm 19 makes it very clear that one of the purposes of the creation is to tell us something and for it to speak a language so that we could understand how glorious God is. The language of nature, what do we call it today? What's the the language of nature? Science. That's what we call it today. Mathematics. Is that the language of nature? These things where we study the natural world and come to conclusions about it, they are a way of letting nature speak. And what we find over and over and over again is that we are living in a world that screams complexity and design and imagination. You think about the fact that you see color and that things are beautiful. You don't need beautiful things in order to have life. It's something we forget. The world does not have to be pretty in order for you to live on it. Um, And yet it is. 
And, and so these things, they declare God's glory, that they work, that they are, are beautiful, that they're functional, um, that he's made it full of amazing things, that the more we discover, the more we're impressed by what we discover. All of this comes together. Isaiah 43, verse 7, everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. So part of the Genesis creation story is when God makes all those things and Jesus is making it, he makes all of those things, everything from the, the birds of the air and the plants and uh, the atmosphere and the sun and the moon and the stars and man himself, they're created for God's glory. So there's a purpose to the creation, too, that God would be glorified. And um, it, though it's true that all of the animal kingdom and whatnot does glorify God in a sense, nobody has a greater capacity to glorify God than mankind. Specifically, for no other reason than we are made in his image. So if you want to think about Jesus in Genesis, one aspect of it is, is why were you made? Who were you created to glorify? Jesus. That, that is the very essence of our existence, is to bring glory to him. Uh, another verse along those lines, Romans chapter 1, verse 20, talks about the creation of the world and how in it his invisible attributes, uh, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made. Um, you do not have to make things so that people can understand how they are made or who made them. You can make something and make it anonymous so that nobody could connect who did it. And you think about that, uh, they've run into that with uh, famous painters sometimes where a famous painter just didn't sign it. And so they don't ever really know whether that guy painted it. They think maybe he did, but it's really hard to tell. And there's some of the brush strokes are the same, but maybe it was one of his students Really hard to tell. God could have easily made the universe in such a way that it didn't tell us or give us any understanding about him. And yet he did it so that you could. He made it in a way so that you would know who Jesus is. So that you could understand the invisible attributes of God, his eternal power, and his divine nature. So all of these things, they, they fit together. Um, any questions or comments or thoughts before we, we move to some other ideas here in Genesis 1? Yes. Mm hmm. Right. It was a purposeful decision to make things. This day we make this. This day we make this. And, to, and time, by the way, is one of those created things, right? He creates space, time, and matter. You, know, you need to have all of those things existing all at the same time. So that is a, it's something that is part of his divine plan is the timeline. And so uh, whether you're looking at Ephesians or you're looking at Genesis, you see a timeline. Yeah. Yep. Timeline. Mm-hmm. Yep. And we're made to care about time and to count time and to count the length of our days. All these different things. So, yes. Any other thoughts or comments? Okay, so um, we've touched on this a little bit already, so we won't spend a ton of time on it. But one aspect of things, when we talk about let us make man in our image, God is a spiritual being and he makes us spiritual beings. So, as Mary pointed out, that makes man different than any other created thing and that now we have an eternal timeline, right? We're, we are now marching forward forever. Nobody ever goes away as a human. Even when you talk about spiritual death, it's not like physical death. When you physically die, there's no more doing at all. When you spiritually die, you're separated from God eternally, but you still, you still exist, you still are. So mankind has been created as a spiritual being uh, to continue to exist uh, for all time. And so there's a distinction in it. And so Jesus is eternal. The Father is eternal. 
The Holy Spirit is eternal, who we also have really not talked about here, but he shows up in the creation account too, as he hovers over the waters. And so you have all of the Godhead there. And these eternal beings make man to exist as a spiritual being who for a time will exist in a physical body, but will exist eternally. So we need to think long term. If there's anything you need to learn in life, it's to learn to think longer term than you currently do. Because right now, what our tendency is as human beings is to think about whatever problem is right in front of me right now. What am I going to do and how am I going to deal with this thing right here? And if something bad happens to us in the short term, we often feel like our life is over. And what we're told over and over and over again in the Bible is those things are small potatoes. That's a paraphrase, by the way. I'm, I'm not sure I've ever read the small potato verse, but all of it is, right? Ultimately, you, you are going to live here on this planet for a short amount of time. And the Bible describes it lots of different ways, that short amount of time. Sometimes it describes it as a hand bread. Sometimes it's a vapor of smoke. It's just short, just like that. But it's always the same thing. You're a spiritual being living for a time and a physical existence. Um, and then he says, let us make man in our image. Um, I bring up Mark 12 because I think Jesus' conversation about paying Caesar taxes does a really good job of helping us to really appreciate what it means to be made in the image of God. Because when Jesus is asked the question, should we pay taxes to Caesar? He asks for a coin. And then what does he ask the people? Whose image is on the coin, right? And if the image on the coin, of course, is Caesar. He says, okay, so it's Caesar's image that's on this coin. So give it to Caesar. It's his, whatever he wants with it. But then he falls up that, with that, rendering to Caesar that which is Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. So then the question becomes, whose image is it, who bears the image of God? And that's Genesis 1, right? That's us. So give Caesar his cash. Give God your everything. And, and um, uh, other texts that we had looked at previously also talk about the idea that Jesus is that uh, perfect image of God. Colossians chapter 1, he's the image of the invisible God. Jesus fulfilled that perfectly in that as he walked on this earth, how much of his life did he give to the Father? When he's in the garden, what does he say? Not my will, but thine be done. So he does everything exactly the way God intends. If you want to know what the Father is like, all you do is look at the Son. If you have any question in your mind about how the Father would handle any topic, you just look at the Son. He's... He has rendered to God all of himself. And that's what we ought to be doing as well. Uh, and so that idea of being made in the image of God is a really powerful statement being made there in Genesis. Um, another aspect of the creation story is this phrase of God saw that it was good. Now, it's that, that phrase, God says, saw that it was good, shows up six times. And then one time at the very end of it, he says, it says that God saw that it was very good. So we have this emphatic statement at the very end of creation. And uh, that brings up a couple of questions. Since that shows up over and over and over again in the Genesis account, what does that tell us about Jesus? What does that tell us about the material, physical world? And what does that tell us about ourselves? One, since Jesus is the creator, what kind of a creator is he? He doesn't make junk, right? He makes good things. So one aspect to it is we have a good creator. And that word good isn't the way that we might use the word good. You know, how was lunch? Yeah, it was good. It, it means Good in the sense of as it ought to be, exactly perfectly fitted for its purpose and meaning and existence. So when Jesus makes, he makes perfectly suited things for their task. And then the world that we live in, what does it tell us about that? It 
tells us it's good. So it, it's, it is suitable for the task, right? Now we're also told, is this world going to last forever? Is that good? It's a weird question, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, and so you have to deal with that element to it, right? So you start running into things like the sweat of the brow and the thorns, and now we have sickness and death and those sorts of things. And those things obviously aren't good, right? But you have a God who initially didn't make any of those things, didn't desire any of those things. And the only reason that all of this stuff will go away is because what's his, his long-term goal, his end game? He wants to get you back to where things are good again, right? So uh, all, all of those things fit together. Uh, how about the yourself? The way and and once again we have to deal with that element of sin, right? It's not good when you sin, but when you look at a brand new baby, are you seeing something good or something sinful? Right? See, the Genesis account lays out for us this image that. We live in a good world, and the problem with it is what you're going to read in the chapters that follow. But that the world itself and mankind itself is meant for good things, created by a good God for good purposes. And our goal is to fashion ourselves as closely back to that model as possible uh, as we live. Um, okay. One very last thing, and I'm not even going to spend really a whole lot of time on it because we don't have a lot of time, but one other thing is at the very end of the creation, you have six days of creation, and then you have Sabbath rest. In the creation story is this idea that God rests. Can, can we agree to the principle that we don't really think God is necessarily tired? That, that's not what, what's going on here. It's not God did six days of work. He's like, I'm, I'm bushed. I don't think I could do anymore. That's not what's going on, right? What God is saying is, I made something the way it ought to, and now rest. And that rest is there for us. Um, you can see in the, the verses that I have uh, up there, Matthew 12 and Hebrews 4, that ultimately what God promises us in Jesus is the rest that is now gone. Right? So you have God makes the world perfect, and he rests, and... It should just be an enjoyable, wonderful, good place. But then we broke it. And now we go through life with toil and sweat and pain and heartache and all these sorts of things. We have the valleys of the shadow of death. We have all sorts of trials and difficulties. And we are stuck with the question of, when will I ever get any rest? Right? And what we're told by God is there is a rest for the saints. So the, the rest that we see in the creation story alludes to the eternal rest that can be found in Jesus. And so all of this stuff comes together to see a picture of a God who wants good things for you, who wants to bless you, who, has, uh, who, who gave us a good world to live in and then uh, sent his son to redeem us so that we might have that good world again, even though we broke it. Any thoughts or questions? Okay, then we'll wrap up there. Uh, next week, we will get into the less fun part where we break it. And uh, <laughs> uh, remember, everybody, we're just getting back in that habit. Uh, classes will let out, and we'll all be back in here in just a couple of minutes.